Hello and welcome to Tochny Weekly, the show that gets behind the headlines to discuss the full-scale Russian invasion of Ukraine. So uh, this week we have a pretty straightforward show for you. Uh, I'm just going to present the news uh, that will be followed by Germany to Ukraine segment. And we'll finally have like a little brief panel discussion. I'm going to call what's going on with uh, permission to strike Russia for Ukraine. Uh, so yeah, without, uh, oh, I, I should mention before we start, um, you know, we used to broadcast simultaneously on both YouTube and Twitter. Uh, however, uh, Elon has uh, changed some some policies and Basically, we now have to pay Twitter if we want to broadcast there. And uh, we're not really interested in doing that. I don't know. We might change our mind at some point. But we, at the moment, we've decided we don't want to do that. And so um, we, we, it feels icky to pay them to give them their own content. So um, we've, we've stopped broadcasting on Twitter. So if you could, uh, you wonderful YouTubers, we really appreciate you guys and your support. Uh, it's been really great to move to YouTube where we have so much more freedom. And obviously, you know, they don't charge us. They've even potentially could uh, pay for things, uh, services that we use and things like that. So um, please do, uh, uh, we, we appreciate our YouTube audience and please do spread the word about us. Uh, please subscribe, please uh, hit the like button uh, on the stream. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much pretty much it in terms of uh, helping us out. Uh, we really do appreciate your support once again and uh, thanks. So uh, I'll go ahead and uh, jump into the news now. Uh, so we'll start with uh, operations news. Uh, it's a little different this week than usual. Usually I talk about like strikes and stuff, but um, not a whole lot, a lot what I could find this week. So uh, anyway, um, starting with a fire broke out at the Omsk Tronmash plant in Omsk, Russia, where tanks uh, and heavy flamethrower systems are manufactured. Uh, the blaze started on the roof of one of the workshops and no injuries reported. According to plant officials, the fire didn't disrupt ongoing production, although it looks like quite a significant fire, as you can see there. Uh, despite official statements, bystanders shared videos online showing thick smoke billowing from the site. Uh, it's part of the Ural Van Zavod. Ural, <laughs> Ural Vagon Zavod. There we go. Ural Vagon Zavod Corporation, which fulfills defense contracts for Russia, including the production of the T-80 tank and uh, the flame terror system. Uh, I I have no information about whether this was started by some kind of sabotage or a drone attack. It looks like drone attack. I wouldn't say it's off the table, but no one's saying it was a drone attack, so it seems unlikely. Um, and you know, no one's really directly saying sabotage, so it's kind of a mystery why it happened. But you know, it's, it seems like a pretty big fire. Could be uh, lack of safety. Could be uh, Ukrainian military intelligence. Who knows? Uh, next item. On September 11th, Ukrainian forces, uh, Hur forces, shot down a Russian Su-30 SM fighter jet over the Black Sea using a manpad system. The aircraft was part of the 43rd Naval Aviation Regiment of the Russian Aerospace Forces and was based at the Saki airfield in Crimea. The jet had been targeting Odessa with missile strikes from a distance, staying outside the range of Ukrainian coastal air defenses. However, the Hur unit intercepted the plane near gas rigs off the Crimea coast. Russian forces lost contact with the jet around 5 a.m. and initiated a search and rescue mission three hours later, deploying a, an AN-26 aircraft uh, and an MI-8 uh, and KA-27 helicopter. Uh, by midday, they discovered aviation fuel slick and uh, debris from a downed jet 70 kilometers northwest of Crimea. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, according to reports, uh, the jet had been launching missiles at the Ukrainian mainland. Uh, Ukrainian radar picked it up, and uh, yeah, they sent the, the crew to hit it with a manpad, and it was downed uh, by a manpad fired from a boat. So uh, cool little operation by Hoor there. Good job, guys. Uh, next item. Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces of Ukraine, Alexander Sirsky, briefed President Volodymyr Zelensky on the military situation in the Donetsk region and Russia's Kursk region. In his evening address, Zelensky highlighted the ongoing efforts to maintain Ukrainian positions in Donetsk despite the challenges uh, on the front line. Uh, Sirsky provided updates on the operations also in the Kursk region, including how Russian forces are responding there. Uh, early reports indicated that 83 combat engagements had occurred at the front, uh, with the most intense fighting centered around Pokrovsk and uh, Kurahove. Uh, also, I believe that uh, Pokrovsk's power and water had been cut. Um, recently. So uh, yeah, situation at Pekros continues to look pretty, uh, pretty dire. 
The BBC, citing correspondent Nick Thorpe, reported that a Russian missile struck Aya, uh, which uh, sorry, the Aya, which is a grain carrying vessel on route from Ukraine to Egypt, uh, while it was in Romania's exclusive economic zone on the night of the 11th and 12th of November. Uh, the Romanian Coast Guard confirmed the incident, which occurred about 55 kilometers from the Romanian port of Svantu uh, in the Danube Delta. Uh, the explosion was reported to local Coast Guard authorities around 11 p.m., and the vessel, which was flying the flag of St. Kitts and Navi, uh, sustained damage to its port side, including the cargo hold and crane, but managed to continue its journey and reach the port of uh, Constanta. According to the UK-based maritime security company, the missile was launched from Russia shortly after the ship departed the Ukrainian port of Chornomorsk in Odessa. Uh, Reuters reported that the strike uh, took place near the mouth of the Danube, with Ukrainian Navy spokespersons uh, confirming that the ship was in Romania's maritime economic zone. The Romanian Navy stated the vessel was outside of their territorial waters and uh, that the vessel hadn't requested any assistance as a result of the attack. Uh, you know, kind of... It's kind of tough ship, I will say. They get hit by a missile and don't even ask for help. Uh, Though Romania is a NATO member, the alliance's collective defense guarantees apply only to sovereign territories of its member states and not to exclusive economic zones. Uh, The attack was part of a larger Russian operation which targeted civilian ships in the Black Sea, which, as far as I understand, is the first time that's happened, uh, which included a WEEP shipment bound for Egypt on the 12th of September. Um, And uh, the price of wheat uh, shot up about 2% as a result of these incidents. On the 13th of September, UK Prime Minister Keir Starmer revealed that no definitive decision had been made regarding uh, Ukraine's use of long-range weapons inside Russia. Other comments have been made since then. We're going to have a little bit more of a detailed talk. I'll let you know what happened, though, at this most recent meeting between the two leaders, which I think is the most significant. Um, According to uh, Politico, although Ukraine has requested support for long-range strikes uh, from Western countries, they have imposed limits on Ukraine's use of weapons like attackums and Storm Shadow missiles. Starmer described the meeting as productive and stated that they've come to a strong position on the matter, but clarified that the discussions were not centered around specific military capabilities. Uh, He also added that uh, at future talks, uh, they'll involve like more participants. Uh, The White House's summary of the meeting emphasized their continued support for Ukraine and like concerns over Iran and North Korea supplying weapons to Russia. Um, And, you know, as we know, uh, President Putin... uh, said basically like it would mean war with russia if that happened and they said like we you know we're, we're considering that something to that effect um and they basically said like they haven't ruled out the use of weapons so point is it was pretty much an as far as i could tell nothing came of this meeting itself but there have been other contradictory statements since then so we'll talk about it on the panel like what is actually going on with this in more detail but i wanted to cover just the meeting itself uh next item <clears throat> Russia is conducting a reckless sabotage campaign across Europe, according to an op-ed by MI chief Sir Richard Moore and CIA director Bill Burns, uh, which was published by the Financial Times. Uh, The piece describes Russia's intelligence activities as part of a broader effort to exploit technology technology for disinformation aiming to undermine democratic nations. Uh, Both Moore and Burns highlighted that uh, the world faces unprecedented challenges, uh, including uh, sorry, while there are other like security challenges in the world, that's basically what they're saying. Russia's war in Ukraine uh, is a very critical issue. They emphasize the importance of continued support for Ukraine, uh, basically saying like Putin can't win or Ukraine can't lose. Uh, the op-ed stresses that Russia's actions represent a serious violation of international norms and the UN Charter, and that intelligence agencies will continue to support Ukraine. Uh, and they mentioned uh, that Ukraine is uh, like an important battleground to understand the evolving role of technology in warfare, uh, including the integration of open source software with military technologies and uh, other things like that. So uh, just kind of an um, interesting op-ed from uh, two heads of former heads of very high profile intelligence agencies. Uh, we've heard a lot of reports about this sabotage campaign Russia's conducting. So to hear, you know, pretty senior intelligence officials confirm its existence, I think is important. Uh, so next topic is economy and aid stuff. It's kind of the biggest uh, topic this week.
The Netherlands has faced challenges in assembling a full Patriot air defense battery for Ukraine due to a lack of participation from allied nations. Uh, if you guys remember, maybe two or three weeks ago, I reported that uh, the Netherlands had some some Patriot bits of a battery that they said they would combine with other countries uh, to try to send Ukraine a full battery. Uh, so yeah, they haven't found any takers. Uh, despite the plan, no allies have joined the initiative within the following three months. And as a result, they've decided to transfer the pledge components without completing the full system. Uh, the defense minister declared that the radar has already been delivered and the launchers will follow soon. And they emphasize that the Netherlands will continue seeking other nations to contribute additional components for a complete system. Uh, and uh, the Netherlands also has ordered two new Patriot launchers uh, to upgrade to older launchers that they have. So potentially they'll send more to Ukraine. So keep up the good work, Netherlands. Uh, just one yeah. quick thing when I... Uh, the two launchers they procured, as far as I understand, that's the re-procurement for the launchers they have delivered to Ukraine uh, in 2023. So it's nothing new for Ukraine, just for their army again. Yeah, you certainly would know more than I do about this. I think there's some kind of relationship between the Germans and the Dutch in terms of these Patriot batteries, right? So that's how well, you have to know all this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The um, the US has in 2023, the US has delivered a battery or a fire unit, and we have delivered. And the Dutch have, um, in addition to our unit, have supplied two launchers, which were integrated in our fire unit, and now they're reprocuring these two launchers. Gotcha. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I because the the head guy mentioned that the launchers will go to Ukraine. Like the if you you heard that the now. three the the three yeah. The, so the announcement from the Netherlands in I believe in April or in May, one of these two months, uh, was that they are trying to assemble a fire unit from components of different countries, and they have said that they are providing a radar and three launchers. Um, and they're seeking for other countries to provide the other, uh, other necessary components. And um, yeah, so that's something different. The three launchers they are now giving to Ukraine is something different uh, than the two launchers they're procuring right now from the US. One is for Ukraine and the other one is re-procurement for their own army. Okay, got it. Cool, cool. So yeah, I don't know, more more good stuff from the Dutch. Uh, so next is uh, Finland. There's a lot of aid this week, guys. Uh, Finland will send additional defense equipment to Ukraine. Uh, they sent a package worth 118 million euros. Uh, this brings Finland's total military support to 2.3 billion uh, total. Uh, the Finnish uh, minister uh, just emphasized uh, they'll continue to provide ongoing military assistance. Um, also, uh, in, in the Nordics, uh, the Swedish government announced the 17th military package for Ukraine. Uh, the, it's valued at 401 million pounds. Um, they're shifting its military support strategy with their package. Uh, there are three major pr procurements, uh, which are worth about 600 million, uh, Swedish kroner, which is, uh, not, I don't know, like a quarter or an eighth of the total package. Um, I don't know how to convert that. Sorry. I should have converted all this stuff. Uh, but it will include uh, like parts, a lot of parts and stuff. It's going to include ground combat equipment, robot systems, anti-aircraft missile systems, anti-tank weapons, recoilless rifles, anti-tank mines, um, as well as I'd say the thing that everyone talked about in this package was um, the Gripen parts. Uh, like there's basically going to send some Gripen parts to Ukraine. Um, I. I we actually had our Swedish uh, contributor explain exactly like what the deal with this was. So maybe uh, we'll have Erlen clarify. It. Uh, Erlen, do you know like why they sent the Gripen parts? So they're not sending Gripen parts, but the Swedish government has procured um, spare parts and and funds to to make sure that some of the existing airframes uh, will be able to continue to fly uh, so that Sweden don't need to buy completely new ones um, for their fleet when they are upgrading them to the E variant, as far as I understood. This will allow down the, the line um, some um, airframes to be freed up and then okay, they can potentially go to Ukraine. So the whole thing is about basically 
procuring spare parts and and funds to to get some airframes ready and available for the next years, basically. Okay, that that makes sense. I think it was a little bit um, confusing for them to lump that together with the aid package for Ukraine, but it makes sense, like why politically or economically they're doing that. So, um, yeah. So the the grip and parts are, as Erlen said, like staying in Sweden, but they're clearly they're they're designed to, in the long term, help the Ukrainian air force in some fashion. Would you, you say that's so, accurate? Yeah, and the thing is that they were very clear about the fact that. Uh, they've been asked not to deliver Gripens now because it would interfere with the F-16 integration. I think there is some political messaging from Sweden in this as well. Okay, got it. So yeah, they're basically sense. saying to the to the F-16 guys who are pulling the, the threads there that, yeah, we're still going, you know, uh, on with this and forward with this. It's not, it's not stopping. So... You know, right. you you guys know that that we're not stopping with this. <laughs> God bless them. Okay, and so uh, yeah, that's that's Sweden and Finnish military aid. So uh, yeah, good good job, guys. Uh, lots of military aid this week. Weirdly, the security conference was last week, but we're getting a lot of announcements this week. Um, so the next item, uh, as part of an ongoing cooperation between the governments of Ukraine and France, uh, Ukrainian railways will receive 19,000 tons of railway rails to upgrade 150 kilometers of railroad track. Uh, this information was shared by the Ukrainian Ministry of Communities and Territories Developments. Uh, there was a discussion between uh, the special envoy of the French president for Ukraine and the deputy prime minister of restoration. Um, and France will deliver the railway rails with the first shipment uh, expected in January of 2025. Uh, and yeah, they just kind of talked about how it's good that they're collaborating on these transportation projects and that other joint projects are making consistent projects or progress with France focusing on uh, regional developments and critical infrastructure like railways. Um, and the $200 million grant between Ukraine and France, which I assume like paid for the procurement of this stuff, uh, prioritizes Ukraine's energy infrastructure and essential infrastructure like railroads. Poland remains the only country that has not yet fulfilled its financial commitment to the Czech initiative for purchasing artillery shells for Ukraine. The Polish Foreign Minister Radislaw Sikorski addressed the delay during a press conference in Kyiv on September 13th, explaining that it was caused by the arrest of the former head of Poland's government strategic reserves agency, who was responsible for the task. So no one, no one can say they aren't trying to make this right, I guess. Uh, Sikorsky pledged that Poland would provide $100 million in support for the pledge over two years, uh, with half of that sum to be allocated in 2024 and the remainder in 2025. Uh, and he assured that Poland is committed to resolving the issue and uh, maintaining their contri contribution to the initiative as they promised. Uh, the Czech initiative, of course, aims to deliver 500,000 shells to Ukraine over the course of the year. And so far, around 20 countries have participated, and the first shipment of 50,000 shells is known to have been delivered earlier in the summer. Uh, I would assume more since then, but they haven't been announced. Uh, Germany's been one of the largest contributors, and Poland has pledged funds. But again, as I said, they haven't yet sent the money uh, or signed the agreement as of August 2024. They've said they will, but they haven't formally done so. The UK has announced a new $600 million aid package for Ukraine during the uh, Foreign Secretary's visit on September 11th, where he was also joined by the US Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken. Uh, this aid covers mainly humanitarian assistance and long-term support. Uh, 315 million pounds have been allocated for the 2024 to 2025 period to address humanitarian energy and stabilization needs. Uh, around 20 million pounds is aimed at fixing the power grid and preparing it for winter. 100 million pounds for humanitarian support. Uh, and 484 million in loan guarantees will be provided through the World Bank uh, for other, like, public critical public services. Uh, the loan guarantee is part of a $3 billion package that the UK pledged during the Ukraine recovery conference in London last year. And they will also uh, supply Ukraine quote with hundreds of additional air defense missiles, tens of thousands of artillery rounds and more ar armored vehicles by the end of 2024. The United States has also announced a $700 million humanitarian aid package for Ukraine as a result of the trip. Uh, the Secretary of State Anthony Blinken made the announcement during his visit. Uh, the total amount, $325 million, uh, will be allocated to repair energy infrastructure. 
and 290 million is earmarked for humanitarian aid intended to support uh, Ukrainians and refugees in the surrounding regions. 102 million will go towards demining efforts to remove landmines. Uh, so now this begins what is just like an endless chunk of U.S. stuff. So I'll just kind of power through it. So also in U.S. news, uh, the Biden administration has requested an extension from Congress to continue providing military aid. I mentioned before that some Ukrainian NGOs are uh, raised concerns about this last week. Uh, so now uh, the Biden administration is seeking like an extension of this money. Uh, there's $5.9 in uh, presidential drawdown authority. Uh, which 5.8 of that is set to expire at the end of the fiscal year, which I think is like in a couple weeks. Um, and that has so far been the main way that the U.S. has quickly provided weapons and equipment to Ukraine. Uh, most of the aid packages that I you know, cover on the show, that's like comes from PDA. So it's kind of concerning that uh, the administration uh, didn't spend this money when they had it you know, under their control and that they're, they now need to renew it. Uh, hopefully it'll get renewed and all that, but uh, yeah. Uh, also, the Ukrainian military has begun using the American uh, 2CT Hawkeye, which is an experimental self-propelled artillery system. There were photos of the system uh, in service that were published by the Tischuk News Agency, which confirmed that the 105 millimeter howitzer uh, reported first delivered in 2024 is being used in combat. Uh, it was handed over to Ukraine by uh, AM General, the company, uh, earlier this year. Uh, it took two weeks to train the Ukrainian crew, and they uh, mentioned previously that it's undergoing combat testing on live targets. Uh, the Hawkeye is notable for its soft recoil system, which reduces the load on stabilizing structures by half, making the unit lighter and more mobile than a conventional system. It's mounted on a Humvee chassis, and it's highly maneuverable and can be transported by aircraft or helicopter. Uh, and yeah, there's some more statistics about it, but it basically, it has a range of about 12 kilometers and it uses standard ammunition. Uh, and it can also use, uh, extended range ammunition for 20 kilometer range and it can fire around eight rounds per minute. So quite a, quite a sophisticated weapon. Uh, also in U.S. news, uh, U.S. chip makers face questions from senators at a hearing about why American made microelectronics uh, from their companies have been found in Russian weapons in Ukraine. The Senate hearing was titled U.S. Technologies Powering Russia's War Machine and was held on September 10th, 2024. It included uh, testimony from executives at AMD, Analog Devices, Texas Instruments, and the Intel Corporation. Uh, they showed data provided by Ukrainian authorities showing that 73% of the recovered components in Russian weapons, I assume electronic components, originated from American companies, with 40% from the companies that are represented at the hearing. And he pointed out that Russia's use of these technologies, uh, Russia uses those to conduct war crimes. Uh, the executives insisted that they comply with all U.S. sanctions and that they take uh, additional voluntary steps to prevent their uh, items from going to Russia. Uh, and they explained that many of the components are basic microchips that aren't subject to export restrictions and are produced uh, were produced before Russia's invasion. Like they're they're not newly produced equipment since after the sanctions that are finding their way in. Uh, however, Blumenthal raised doubt, citing evidence that newer chips have, in fact, been found in modern Russian weapon systems, including hypersonic missiles. And he called on the companies to send teams to Ukraine to inspect the evidence firsthand, rather than relying solely on their own like internal tracking systems. Uh, Blumenthal urged companies to strengthen their controls over microchip sales, particularly through third-party countries like Turkey, Kazakhstan, and Georgia, where transactions involving these products have increased. And the company representatives aff affirm that they regularly monitor export compliance and that they've intensified uh, oversight of their sales to high-risk countries like those mentioned. Um, Texas Instruments claimed to have no evidence of its products reaching Russia. Intel, AMD, and Analog Devices admitted that they tightened controls to curb flows of chips that they saw going to Russia through intermediary nations. So sounds like Texas Instruments maybe needs to wake up a little bit because, yeah, Russia wants your chips, guys. Uh, finally, uh, last piece of U.S. news. Uh, the U.S. De Department of Defense awarded a $1.2 billion contract to Raytheon for the production of AMRAAM, uh, which are medium-range air-to-air missiles. Uh, this is an announcement made on September 11th. Uh, the contract includes foreign military sales to countries including Ukraine, as well as uh, many others. Uh, the AIM-120 uh, AMRAAM is a radar-guided missile designed for beyond-range visual combat. It's usually used by fighter jets, so it would be used by Ukrainian F-16s. And the production of missiles, spare parts, and related equipment will take place in a factory in Tucson. And the expected completion date for the full contract is December 31st, 2028. So 
probably won't see anything immediate in the immediate future, but it's always good to have these orders in the pipe because it allows uh, some freedom to give existing stocks. Despite sanctions imposed by the US, EU, UK, and Japan to block the sale of aviation tires to Russia, more than 30 million worth of tires from Western manufacturers were imported. Sorry, more than 30 million worth of tires from Western manufacturers were imported into the country in 2023. This is according to a Ukrainian government report. Uh, the tires, including those made by Michelin, Dunlop, Goodyear, and Bridgestone, entered Russia through intermediaries, which circumvented trade restrictions. Uh, Michelin tires accounted for the majority of the imports, with 70% of the total worth $28 million. Uh, these included tires used in the aircraft of Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov. Uh, Goodyear, Dunlop, and Bridgestone tires were also found in Russia. Uh, shipments originated from countries such as China, Turkey, UAE, Saudi Arabia, and various Central Asian countries. And uh, some shipments were even traced directly from the West via third-party intermediaries, uh, indicating potential manipulation of transit routes. Uh, the National Agency on Corruption prevented, or sorry, the National Agency on Corruption Prevention in Ukraine uh, highlighted the possibility of false transit schemes where the tires are getting in through like fake, uh, fake orders where the destinations are changed after the fact. Um, and there's no direct evidence implicating the manufacturers in any of the schemes. Um, Michelin and Goodyear and Bridgestone basically affirmed their commitment to complying with sanctions and promising investigations. Michelin noted that it ceased exports to Russia in March and closed all operations there. And uh, Goodyear and Bridgestone emphasized strict monitoring process. It sounds like Michelin is the main one we have to be concerned with. 70% of the imports were Michelin tires. So um, yeah, hopefully Michelin will conduct an investigation. It seems like that's what we get every time, right? It's like we find tons and tons of, uh, of a product in Russia. And then the company goes, Oh, we're complying with sanctions. We don't know anything about that. And like our own investigation found out that we're totally in compliance. So hopefully we'll see some more traction on uh, some of these sanctions. Uh, also in sanctions news, Spain blocked Hungary's attempt to purchase Talgo, which is a Madrid based train manufacturer due to concerns that Hungary's close ties with Moscow could compromise Ukraine's reconstruction efforts. Uh, the Spanish government vetoed the 619 million euro bid from Hungary's Gans Mavag over uh, national security concerns. And uh, they actually mentioned the word Ukraine uh, in, in their like messaging. They didn't say specifically what the concern was, but they said like it's Ukraine related. Um, the company, which is owned by a private equity firm, which is linked to Hungary's leading oil and gas company, has uh, close ties to Prime Minister Viktor Orban, as do all oligarchs in Hungary. And uh, they criticize the decision as arbitrary, of course. Uh, they continue to, the company continues to process Russian crude oil despite the ongoing war in Ukraine. And this raises concerns among Spain and other European countries. Uh, the veto highlights increasing tensions between Hungary and other EU countries, uh, particularly due to Hungary's delayed support for actions against Russia, like sanctions. And uh, the prime minister of Spain has openly called uh, Orban pro Putin. Uh, a Spanish official told FT that Talgo's advanced engineering, which allows trains to easily switch between Ukraine's wider tracks, uh, like the Soviet-era style tracks, and Europe's narrower tracks, is crucial for Ukraine's transport infrastructure. The Ukrainian Railways is currently developing a European gauge line uh, from one uh, part of the country to another near the Hungarian border, and this should help facilitate the integration of Ukraine's rail system within the EU. So uh, this is like a very crucial little piece of technology. And Spain thought that it was important that, you know, a not evil country have control of it. So they vetoed the purchase. So uh, yeah, good on Spain. Ukraine and the International Monetary Fund have successfully concluded the fifth review of their extended fund facility agreement, which is valued at 15.6 billion US dollars. Uh, the Prime Minister of Ukraine announced that the review confirms that Ukraine has met all quantitative and structural requirements uh, for the uh, end of June 2024. They emphasize that the agreement signals their continued commitment for important reforms and, uh, you know, uh, complying with uh, the requests of their national partners. The IMF's board uh, was expected to approve the review or it's expected to approve the review soon. And it, that would unlock an additional $1.1 in uh, more funding for Ukraine. Uh, this marks the first IMF mission to fully operate in Kyiv since the onset of the full-scale invasion, and uh, Shmihal expressed gratitude to the team for their efforts and support. Uh, the financial assistance from the IMF and other international partners has allowed Ukraine to cover significant non-military budgetary expenses 
and enables the government to focus on domestic resources and uh, defense efforts. Uh, also, just uh, I don't really have time to go into the full report, but as I mentioned last week, uh, Ukraine has denounced a decision by the IMF to send a mission to Russia to basically assess its current economic status. Um, and uh, the EU, uh, several countries and uh, several spokespeople from the uh, government of the EU have denounced that uh, recent mission sort of in the same vein as Ukraine. So uh, more on the IMF there. Uh, last piece of economic news, I believe, is uh, on September 13th, the Central Bank of Russia raised its key interest rate by 100 basis points, which marks uh, to be 19%. This is a 2.5 fold increase since the start of the full scale invasion. And uh, this is uh, the result of uh, financial strain from inflation from the conflict. Uh, Russia's oil revenues remain robust and uh, there are high oil prices, uh, as well as reluctance of Western companies to restrict the transport of the commodity. Uh, with inflationary pressures in Russia elevated, the annual inflation rate is expected to be around 7%. Um, inflation had reached 9% in like last month, and the bank highlighted the rapid growth in domestic demand as outpacing supply. Uh, recent economic data from uh, the second quarter of 2024 uh, suggests a deceleration of economic growth, and this is attributed to supply constraints weakening and external demand rather than a reduction in domestic demand. Uh, the Russian labor market is also... Uh, Part of the reason why uh, inflation is a problem, it's extremely tight as a result of the invasion. Uh, unemployment is at historic lows and ongoing labor shortages in the manufacturing sector uh, continue to uh, raise prices. Uh, and yeah, wages continue to rise faster than productivity and consumer activity has slowed down a bit, but it remains relatively strong. Um, yeah, it's mainly like the war economy that's causing all these problems. Uh, and they hinted at future rate hike hikes. Okay, so that was by far the biggest section this week. Uh, next is uh, international relations. Uh, so uh, I'll go ahead and skip this one. I think I pretty much already covered the meeting between... Uh, oh, well, actually, no, sorry, this is a little different. I mentioned the um, meeting between the secretaries of state, which happened in Ukraine. That's the one on screen. But actually, the two leaders also met, um, and they held a meeting at the White House. No, I, I did cover this. Sorry. I'll go ahead and skip this uh, section. Um, so this week, uh, there was a six-point peace plan that was proposed by China and Brazil, and uh, President Zelensky reacted to it uh, pretty strongly, labeling it as destructive. Uh, the plan was introduced in May, and it's seen as sort of an alternative to Ukraine's own efforts at uh, creating a peace plan, uh, and doesn't include the participation of Ukraine. Uh, China claims to be neutral in the war, uh, denying any involvement in providing lethal aid to either side. Uh, however, Western nations have argued that Ukraine, uh, that Beijing is increasingly supplying critical resources to Russia. Uh, Brazil uh, has also positioned itself as neutral. Uh, the country's refused to arm Ukraine, and it has acknowledged that Russia's invasion was a mistake. Uh, it's also suggested that Ukraine consider giving up Crimea as part of a peace deal. Uh, the six-point plan refers to the war as a crisis and calls for non-escalation, a peace conference involving both sides, more humanitarian aid, and efforts to prevent nuclear proliferation. Uh, in contrast, uh, the 10-point peace plan by Ukraine demands a full withdrawal of Russian troops, accountability for war crimes, and the release of prisoners. A uh, summit in Switzerland uh, promoted the plan, and China and Brazil, uh, sorry, China didn't attend that uh, conference, and Brazil's representative attended but did not uh, sign the resulting communique. Uh, and uh, Zelensky sharply rejected this plan, arguing that it fails to support Ukraine's efforts to end Russia's aggression against their country. And he questioned the idea of compromise, emphasizing that giving up Ukrainian territory while civilians are being killed is unacceptable. Uh, so far, around 45 countries have expressed support for the plan in some fashion, whereas the Ukrainian peace plan that was handled at the Switzerland conference, 110 countries uh, officially expressed backing by signing the memorandum. India has successfully secured the release of 45 of its own citizens who were illegally conscripted to serve in the Russian military and forced to fight against Ukraine. Uh, this is according to a statement from the Indian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, the ministry revealed that 50 more Indian nationals are still involved uh, as part of Russian forces and efforts are underway to bring them back. Uh, during Indian Prime Minister Modi's recent visit to Moscow, uh, the, according to him, uh, President Putin assured him that all Indians who had been misled and forcibly recruited into the Russian military would be released. Uh, it's taken a little while, I guess. 
uh, in connection with these events, uh, Indian authorities have arrested four individuals involved in a trafficking scheme in, in India. Uh, and there was also a discovery of another large human trafficking network uh, exposed earlier in March, uh, which was operating across multiple Indian states. It lured young people to Russia with false promises of employment and then coerced them into fighting the war. The investigation led to the seizure of 50 million rupees, which is around $600,000 along with documents and electronic records linked to the trafficking operation. Uh, last item, I'll just cover this very quickly. Uh, UK, France, and Germany announced additional sanctions against Iran following uh, confirmation that Moscow has received ballistic missiles from Tehran. Uh, this is confirmed on September 10th. They issued a joint statement. They highlighted that the countries previously warned Iran that they would do this if these transfers occurred. Uh, and the sanctions aim to address uh, what they called an escalation by both Iran and Russia. Uh, also, the U.S. Secretary of State uh, during a press conference in London also uh, commented on this transfer and uh, basically said this uh, allows Russia to focus on using their own missile stockpiles against Ukraine. It gives them more freedom in that regard. So I don't know. I just like compare this to sort of the North or the South Korean response to North Korea. Right. To me, this looks like the right response. You tell them beforehand, we're going to sanction you if you do this. When they do it, you sanction them. And you ideally, you do it in concert with other countries so that you show them it's like a united response. That's To me, that seems like this will probably deter Iran from doing this stuff in the future, but maybe not. Uh, so last item this week, uh, or last topic, I should say, uh, is just sort of Ukraine uh, domestic news. So first item there. During a recent press conference, uh, Prime Minister Denis Shmihal announced that Ukraine's military budget faces a significant shortfall of around $12 billion this year. Uh, this is the result of the ongoing war. Uh, the strain on the budget is intensified by ongoing recruitment efforts and the need to fill vacancies within the armed forces personnel. Uh, Shmihal uh, explained that maintaining military personnel comes at a high cost, with the government spending around 29000 annually on each soldier who's on the front line. And those in supportive roles uh, receive considerably lower wages, uh, which are closer to the national average income. So in other words, like they need quite a bit of money to keep these guys on the front line. Uh, efforts to address the financial gap are underway with the government in discussions with the IMF regarding their budget. Uh, Shmihal also noted that the talks have been difficult as Ukraine must fund their military largely on their own. Uh, the international partners have mostly limited their financial support for defense. Like in other words, when a country like the U.S. gives money to the Ukrainian government budget, it's usually specifically not allocated to the defense budget. Uh, so, yeah, hopefully Ukraine's able to bridge the gap. Uh, they're considering several options, including domestic borrowing, raising taxes and other financial strategies. Uh, also, one proposal is to increase the military levy. Uh, a draft law has been submitted to the parliament and Ukraine hopes to recover about 50 billion hryvnias from confiscated Russian assets next year, which could also be used to finance the military budget. And uh, last two items uh, this week, the International Committee of the Red Cross has temporarily suspended operations at its Dnipro office after three of its workers were killed in a Russian strike on September 12th. The attack targeted the village of Viroluivka and Konstantinivka in Donetsk Oblast. Uh, according to the governor uh, of the region, uh, Vadim Filashkin. Uh, in addition to the fatalities, a truck carrying humanitarian aid and a car was destroyed, and two other employees of the ICRC, the International Red Cross, were injured. Uh, Alexander, uh, a spokesperson for the Ukrainian government uh, delegation of the International Red Cross, confirmed the suspension of activities at the Dnipro office and did not provide a timeline for reopening. Uh, the office itself was not a direct target, but ongoing strikes in the region continue to threaten personnel who uh, work at the Red Cross on the front lines. Uh, at the time of the attack, the team had been preparing to distribute firewood and fuel briquettes to local residents. Uh, they'd been actively distributing aid during the strike, and the, or sorry, the, they mentioned in their report that had they been actively distributing aid during that strike, the number of casualties could have been higher. Uh, despite the incident, uh, ICRC, in its official statement, refrained from naming the perpetrator of the attack uh, in their statement. Uh, they didn't blame Russia. They basically just said like a tragic strike happened and killed people, uh, stating they're uncertain about the identity of the attackers. Uh, this cautious stance drew criticism from the president of Ukraine and, uh, of course, like a lot of people online, uh, as they were reluctant to attribute the strike to Russia. Uh, and obviously, Ukraine said this is another example of Russian terror. 
On the same day, Russia also attacked other places, other uh, civilian targets, including uh, the, the village of Konstantinivka I mentioned, as well as the village of Borova in Kharkiv. Uh, and that, that attack killed five people and injured nine others. Uh, also, uh, U.S. Uh, this is just a, a brief thing uh, that I forgot. Uh, U.S. Deputy Secretary of State Management and Resources, uh, Richard Verma, announced the United States has implemented special import restrictions on cultural artifacts from Ukraine. Uh, they spoke at the Ukraine House in Washington. Uh, Verma explained the new measures are designed to help protect Ukraine's heritage by preventing the trafficking of cultural items that are Ukrainian and ensuring that looted artifacts are returned to their rightful place. Uh, Verma stressed that Ukraine's cultural heritage is a key element of their national identity and has become a target of Russian aggression. Uh, he expressed confidence that Ukraine with international support will prevail. So um, yeah, just a good little uh, thing from the U.S. to help prevent the trafficking, particularly of Russian looted uh, Ukrainian cultural artifacts. And the last item this week, sadly, I couldn't find any uh, updated information on it. So the, the most recent information I have about it is a, as of two days ago. Um, a Russian attack on civilian infrastructure has left 151 miners trapped underground at the Dobropilia mine in, Demets in Donetsk Oblast. Uh, Mikhailo Volinets, the head of the Confederation of Free Trade Unions of Ukraine, uh, so I assume the miners' union, uh, reported the incident on Facebook, stating that the city and nearby areas lost power as a result of the strike, and that caused the coal mine to be cut off from electricity and the miners to be trapped. Without power, the mines are facing dangerous conditions, including gas buildup and flooding. And uh, Volinets added that the situation poses a serious risk to the health of the miners and the uh, stability and safety of the mining equipment, which could be severely damaged due to the ongoing flooding in the mine because uh, they don't have like the pumps to get the water out. So uh, hopefully those guys are hopefully there's been some change in the situation that's positive. That's the report as of two days ago that they were trapped. So, uh, yeah, that wraps up my news report for this week. Uh, I will uh, go ahead and turn it over now to uh, my colleague Germanade to Ukraine. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Um, hello, guys. As always, I will now present the most important news from uh, Germany regarding uh, Ukraine. Uh, we have three items this week. Um, let's start with the delivery of 23 ambulances designed as mobile intensive care units, which were co-financed by the American and German governments. Um, these vehicles were handed over to the, uh, to the Ukrainian Ministry of Health by the WHO on Wednesday. Um, they are being distributed among uh, regional emergency and uh, disaster medicine centers. Whoa, what a sentence. For example, in Saburizia, Donetsk, Kharkiv, Dnipro, uh, Odessa, Sumy, and other regions. A day later, according to the Saporizhia Regional uh, Military Administration, a backhoe loader and a double cap transporter financed by the German government were handed over to a unit of the Municipal Special Paramilitary uh, Emergency Service. I just want to point out from a German perspective, the word backhoe loader sounds quite funny or dirty, however you want to say it. <laughs> Anyway, um, this special equipment will help ensure safety, efficient logistics and the restoration of normal life in areas affected by the Russian war of aggression or uh, emergencies. And already as the last item of this week, um, for the video of the week, I wanted to show you an iconic video of a uh, German delivered Gipatz Park. Um, the video, let me just pause it for one second. Um, the video, which was recorded already in 2022, shows one of the uh, Gepard's bugs intercepting a Russian cruise missile. Uh, for this video, I actually um, want to be silent for a second, so you can enjoy it and also hear the Gepard uh, shooting. Yes, contact! Yes, Very good. And uh, yeah, that's basically all I had for you this week. Um, back to you, Joseph.